Good afternoon, everyone. Um, COPD is a horrible disease. And in primary care, many times patients come back multiple times just because they come back as bronchitis, they come back as uh, pneumonia, they can come back as a, more, you know, a number of things. And we've seen those patients in our practice. Currently, there's not a good screening tool to, to try to find these patients early on and help them. Um, because m m many uh, primary care practices are using antibiotics, they're using steroids, uh, as in uh, not a health, I mean, uh, you know, oral steroids, but um, it, the nice thing about the study was that, that we were looking at a, a simple screening tool, five questions, and what about your hand health barometer? So um, that's basically what, what uh, we wanted to do. How can we, the screeners increase clinical detection and treatment and, and do it in a, in a matter that it is early? Um, so those definitely were easy questions for us. Now, we also, in, we, want, we also wanted to do other things. As you know, we are working through LANET. We also wanted to know if federal qualified health centers, community health centers in Los Angeles, have the capacity to participate in clinical studies and drug studies. One of, one of the reasons I, I was specifically interested is that we serve mostly a minority population. Nationally, we know the minority particip under-participate in clinical studies. And at the same time, we are also uh, beneficiaries of medications. But if they have not been tried on our patients to see if there is any specific issues or, or related, then we don't know how well they work. And there have been some unique studies uh, in different populations that show different results. So it is important for us and also to increase the number of minorities participating in clinical studies. So what about the answer? So anyway, what about the first question that I told, said about the um, can, can community clinics uh, participate as a form of growth, income, and discovery? And yes, we can do. Yes, we have done it. We collected uh, service, our audits, over 1,000 over patients, 18 practices. Uh, we, of course, we partner with UCLA and Dr. Duval, uh in a very productive, respectful, and uh, you know, community-based manner. So here is uh, the five uh, uh, picture of the five question uh, screener and the handheld parameter. Here is the site. Now you uh, individually will know what sites are. You know, site one through uh, uh, through eighteen. And if I can just interject, so um, you were sent earlier this morning a site specific number. That number was assigned to you in your clinic, so that way, when you're looking through these numbers, again, these numbers will be made available to you, or the reports will be made available to you after today's presentation or session, and um, you can have a closer look at them. But uh, for the purpose of demographics, we'll go ahead and. Just uh, slide through these to get to the meat of, of the presentation. Okay. One of the, just to highlight on some of the demographics here, you you have age, sex, ethnicity, and smoking history. Uh, and one of the highlights to me is, you know, of course, the number of participants. Most so mostly female uh, in their fifties, mostly Hispanic, and. The the smoking history range from about you know from about fifty between twenty uh, twenty percent or so to about fifty in some practices. So that is that is uh, very dramatic because we know COPD is closely associated with smoking. Race uh, as as you can see here uh, the way it is divided. I think that most of Hispanics are put under white, and so that's uh, that's uh, that's better than there. Of course, education for the different sites uh, between uh, 
schooling, and most folks had elementary or some secondary education. Our insurance type, of course, uh, we saw in some sites an elevated number of people who were self pay, meaning uninsured. And in some of the sites, they also had elevated numbers of folks who had Medi Cal. Tobacco use, um, you know, it, it depends, it went on. Of course, most were, most sites had no smokers, but there were some sizable numbers, even up to like even the, in the mid 20s. And folks were smoking every day to some day. Um, so that is something that, is, that we found that, that is something we need to continue to follow up. The visa types, most folks were not there for respiratory visits. These were patients who came in for all their reasons. Um, and uh, a small percentage actually came with respiratory uh, symptomatology. Now, 13 patients were diagnosed with COPD at the at baseline. You know, and then there are the site, uh, the site numbers. Um, and depends on R1. Remember, R1 being the, the screener plus the plus the uh, the parameter or the screening only or or um, or the control. So then you can see the different different folks in different. Um, uh, arms of the study. Now, how this is to me the diagnosis rate in here, you know, how many new diagnoses were made? So, it, the diagnosis rate was computed by the number of, the, of patients with new clinical diagnosis COPD over the total number of patients with no prior COPD. We had ex, uh, 13 existing cases who had. COPD before, excuse me, mm -hmm. I, I was trying to go that other way. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, 30 patients had existing diagnosis of COPD. Um, now we have 102 patients who have suggested uh, out of 607, it's about you know 18 or so percent of those patients who took the screener had some positive answers, right? Now, of course, the difference between those is uh, 89 patients because we had uh, 13 who we know, so about 9% or so, who could have been missed cases. And uh, the new diagnosis was something from the screening. We had eight patients and two who were diagnosed at the control site. So the new COPD diagnosis, so we had out of uh, 1,000 patients who had 10 new diagnoses were made five with the uh, screener and plus the um, uh, pl plus the spirometer and three with all the screener and two in the control site. Now the new COPD diagnosis, uh, here you, you have by arms, arm one, and uh, which ones, the number of patients they, ha they had a baseline plus the new discover you can see those numbers per uh, different sites that, this, that have been in the diagnosis rate, which I showed you earlier. So we're we're going to get ready to show the tables for the three the three arms again. Um, I ask that you're patient with us in kind of viewing these um, slide by slide, as these will be sent to you after the session. Right. So this is arm two, and it shows you. The by side who was diagnosed and also the diagnosis rate and the number of patients with no um, no prior COPD and uh, this is arm three your control um, and the number you know then here we only found two patients who were newly diagnosed during this study. But that's an actually very important point that he said, because remember, you had to capture the new diagnosis during the eight-week follow-up, and I think in safety net practices, many people would say that patients don't come in a lot of times for follow-up right. unless they have acute episodes. And so I really felt that at least in our region, that eight weeks was definitely not long enough to capture any 
any new respiratory related clinical actions or um, new CFPB. I'm sorry, I just want to say that point. Thank you. It was a good one. We have a secondary endpoint, which is respiratory related clinician actions. Um, and this is also a rate. So, a number of patients needing, you know, one, more than one criteria for a secondary endpoint action divided by the total number of patients with no prior diagnosis of COPD. And those is, what are those secondary actions include? A new diagnosis of COPD, a referral for PSPs, a referral for pulmonologists, or a prescription for a respiratory medication. So any of those actions, uh, and we had a number of patients uh, that looked at that. So uh, the, now any of those, in ARM1, uh, those in different sites range from 7% to 1%. And here's the actual numbers of those actions related to the screening, you know, by sites. Um, and you can see that uh, there, the, there is a number of uh, uh, of those, and then the the actual respiratory related clinician action rate. Again, uh, you can see the numbers from seven percent in in, uh, in one side, side six, you know, uh, all the way to one point seven, side seventeen. Now on arm two, which is only the screener, uh, you can also see that range from seven to one. So in similar ranges than the other. And here's the actual data from that arm two that it was against on the screener. And this is arm three, much lower rates, or at least the range from three to 1.85. This is the control arm. And here's the actual data. Um, that you will see. Now, the physician's response uh, on ARM1, you can see it specifically to one of those. It's the user's parameter, and we're, we're, it's across all the site, all those sites are ARM1. So, you know, using this parameter, was this parameter useful, the ease, um, the use of the screener in the future, so these are the physicians, how they how physicians felt about the use of this stuff. And overall, they had um, good responses for this. Now, ARM2, the questions were exclusively about the screener, not, because they were not using this parameter. So uh, from a, a, uh, uh, a scale from zero to five, uh, most folks felt that the uh, well, folks in general felt that the screener was useful, and then we did not collect any on norm three, of course, because they were the uh, control group. So, what are our conclusions? About nine percent of our patients were newly diagnosed with CPD when we used the screener in primary care practices. We screened patients with both the questionnaire and the handheld parameter. Providers are limited, you know, additional advantage. And the screening programs can be used with clinician right. patients to do better uh, COPD diagnosis and management. All right, so what are our lessons? What are these, these wonderful lessons? One is that, um, well, we looked at about a thousand patients, right? Um, patients, the paper screening have limited value at this point, um, and to move forward, you might you might need to be delivered in a in an electronic manner with EHR. When we did the study, it was before EHR for I think all of the clinics that participated, all of them were still in paper, and um, now I think most of them have moved into uh, and using EHR. Uh, the other lessons learned were about the patient willingness to use the screener. And it kind of varied, and, and the, the interviewers commented that some subjects had difficulty inter interpreting the questions. This is only five questions about how much you smoke or you have. Um, 
and breathing difficulties, but some people had uh, maybe the way they were phrased. Uh, I remember that we, we saw that our, our patients had um, uh, not much uh, formal education, so that might be the reason that the questions needed to be formatted in a simpler manner. Uh, the two, uh, these two now, it's an added step to a business schedule. Now, it points out, and the, the direction that this study points out, is that if we start using some type of screening tool that is targeted to specific patients, you know, patients who have specific respiratory complaints, um, that might be, it might increase your diagnosis rate. Because remember, the way it was done, a lot of the patients did not come in for respiratory reasons. They were just there for other stuff. So I added um, uh, a more targeted tool might be useful to see uh, Also, we noted, and lastly, I want to say, the clinics noted that they had the, the capacity to participate in drug study and, and uh, rigorous clinical trials. The clinics were nimble. We were able to recruit patients in one-fifth of the time that took other people. And... Um, you know, we, are, we have a perfect score on audit. So we got some good lessons. Uh, it was an interesting study, and it points to good directions. Um, so side-level recommendations from LA, you know, the COPD screener with further re refinement um, could be a useful targeted tool for patients who, are, who might be at risk of COPD. Uh, the guidelines of, of the clinical standard guidelines from the DOD or the, in the VA um, use some clear treatment uh, algorithms, and you can we can look about setting up a registry to manage existing COPD patients and how um, uh, use existing templates for those registries with these patients. So some of you asked. Um, thank you, Dr. Aguilar. Some of you asked about how to um, uh, send some requests about uh, possible best practices and, and how to manage chronic disease patients. So we thought we'd go ahead and just post up a couple of, of websites that you can go to, uh, to to review some of those practices. Um, it, it, it appears that AMGA has some really good good um, cases, case studies and also tools that, that are attached to those case studies for best practices in chronic disease management. Um, because of the nature of this uh, this session and, and time, it's um, we weren't able to go over any of these cases in specific. But if you guys are interested in perhaps, um, you could always go to this site or follow up with um, either myself or Nadia after the session to find out more. And again, here's another site on diagnosing chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And then an, also an, another NISTI tool out there um, produced by the VA. They, they call it the COPD pocket card. Uh, it, it has some algorithms and, and helps out not just with diagnosing, but also um, on how to treat. So I'd like to open this to, to, Dr., to Dr. Knox on next steps. Dr. Knox, are you? I'm sorry, I guess they were on mute. So what we wanted to do uh, next is, before opening it up to, to questions, or perhaps Hello? actually this is... Hi. Am I, am I, can you guys hear me now? Yep, I can hear oh, you. Sorry about that. I had too many mute buttons going. Um, so I can talk briefly about next steps. And also I wanted to reflect on, I think there was a really important slide that Dr. Aguilar showed. Um, that was, if you kind of break down the numbers, it looks like of the patients that met eligibility requirements for the study, about 15% were showing symptoms of COPD, just out of that general population. 10% of those patients had already been diagnosed, already been detected. And then when you added the screener, an additional 10% were identified. But that means that of those folks with symptoms, assuming that that translated to COPD, about 80% were being missed still, even when you added in the screener, um, if I'm actually reading those numbers right. 
Um, one of the things that uh, Dr. Duval and I have been talking about, and, and we hope to speak to Dr. Aguilar as well, is looking at a way to make the screening process fit better with the new electronic environments in clinics. Um, one of the things that I think made the screening process difficult to integrate into clinical care was the fact it was paper-based when everybody was moving to electronic-based records. And so our next um, step in this particular study is going to be testing an electronic mechanism for screening patients in the weight room that gets translated wirelessly, transmitted wirelessly into the electronic health record for use at point of care. Um, and Dr. Duval and I are currently working on that proposal, and then um, hopefully we can engage some of you all in that if you have interest. Yeah, I'd like to so, get some comments from the investigators too. What, what? First of all, just your general impression of participating in the study, um, and what types of things for identifying your COPD patients earlier would you like to see? I mean, part of the issue is also that many patients are symptomatic, but they haven't complained of their symptoms. What they do is they modify their lifestyle to adapt to their increasing symptom severity. So you, that's partially why the physician doesn't even find out about them until they've moved into a moderate stage of disease. So, um, anybody have any uh, comments about that? About how they would like to see um, earlier identification made of patients? Um, one of the things I was interested in is if you have the capacity to perform PSP on site. What what are the barriers to that? Were the barriers that they just um, just want to treat symptomatically first? Um, are they the, it's the access to the spirometry? Is it that the time it takes to do it um, that you don't have the enough staff to perform it for you? Because the physician does not have to perform the spirometry, as you know. So what do you see as the primary barriers here for that? Remember to take yourself off mute when you're speaking. No, I don't Dr. I, hi, hi, Dr. Tang. Hi, guys. So, you know, I'm the regional director for the Ultimate site in Orange County. I'm very happy to see Dr. Duvall. Dr. Duvall, I, I was one of your residents years ago. I don't even remember me. I know, I know. I was so happy to see you. Name on there. <laughs> you were one of our best You were great. So I, I do, Dr. Uh, Duval hit it on the head for us. You know, uh, clinically, as providers, I think we know this is all important, but getting the equipment, finding the time, the personnel, the space, and then a big thing is definitely the training. So the consistent training of staff, when sometimes staff turnover is kind of uh, inconsistent or too high. That's, that, those are the primary challenges, uh, bringing new innovation and new systems into place. I do feel, though, as medical leaders, we have to push this, though. If, if we state that um, if we see the evidence and we see the impact it's making on our patient population, then we need to prioritize the space, the training, the staffing, the equipment to do the, uh, such screening measures. But it's convincing operations and, and divvying up space um, in our site definitely has been very concerns. Right, and um, part of the reason for the screener, part of the goal was to really identify patients that would benefit the most from full spirometry. In other words, you know, the ones that are the most symptomatic or the smokers that have been missed somehow. And, you know, in the, so the gold, the gold guidelines, gold is the um, a global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease. That's the international um, commission that really sets the guidelines for COPD worldwide. And they did an update last year. And in their update, they really moved back from mandating spirometry to confirm the diagnosis because they really feel that most of it is just making the diagnosis based 
on smoking history, based on exacerbations, and they said we could use spirometry um, to make a confident diagnosis. In other words, if you're concerned that there's um, overlap with asthma, which many of these patients have, or if you want it, if they're not responding to your um, medical management the way you want. So they're pushing back some on the need to confirm all COPD diagnoses with spirometry. So as I was saying, what we want to do is really um, better define the locations that we do want to do because it's too cumbersome. It's just not working on everybody. And I would recommend the COPD um, 2012 update. I said to Jessa, if, if, you, if you would all like to get some sort of clinical update and guidelines, um, American Thoracic Society, ATS, also publishes guidelines. Um, we'd be willing to do that if, if you're interested. Um, otherwise, I could send some information and links to Vanessa, and she could forward it all to you as well. So I knew that there. I know that there's a couple of um, new, new um, or a couple of individuals that are new to this study, and perhaps this is something that's coming about. It is the results are coming in a couple um, long or a long months after the fact of the study. But if you have anything, um, how, what are your takes on this study that you weren't necessarily a part of at first? <laughs> If we do decide to do, they're talking about doing a follow-up study with this, um, with Bippy, would, would you all be interested in what would motivate you to participate? Because we'd love to obviously have the same clinics that participated in the first trial and the second trial. Um, would you be interested in doing that? So this is Dr. Chang once again. Sharing this information with our providers would be would be great. Uh, so that they know that their involvement actually brought out brought about some uh, results and some outcomes, and then getting for me getting their input on how we can kind of prioritize. Um, you know, we do a presentation journal clubs through our Ultimate sites, and maybe presenting something like this to several of our providers, specifically family practitioners, internal medicine, might be a good way to communicate. Um, I think that'd be nice. In addition, to follow. -up. Come and do an on-site um, CME, so to speak, or update. Pre yeah, maybe I'm just presenting the data and then on COPD specifically. But then it's nice to kind of see that we had this going on in our site that we were involved with the study. And I guess our providers get more engaged, would be I think a very nice uh, aspect. <laughs> so, that sounds perfect. Yeah. So, what what kind of meeting did you say that was, Dr. Chang? We have occasional journal clubs. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Gallardo uh -huh. actually does coordinate these, and so we can find a, a journal club topic or just go over the study itself and and kind of go through some of the results. And That's for me, exciting. it's always good to hear feedback from the providers about what their personal experience has been, and that helps me to integrate and prioritize those changes we can make internally. Fantastic. That's a great idea. Um, so, you know, one, one question I had also is the... Uh, how patient education falls into this? How can we better, you know, inform our patients about uh, their own symptoms and resources and connections? And if we could do something through health education at our site, we have several promotors, and getting them involved to understand COPD would be wonderful as well, through maybe our health ed, health ed supervisors or directors. That's, that's very forward-thinking of you, Dr. Chang. You're talking about um, patient-centered care. Um, connection. That's a very big part of guidelines because patients need to be educated about their symptoms, and um, in order to reduce the risk of exacerbation, um, they need to, you know, have be able to have that dialogue with their clinician because if they don't report increasing symptoms, you can't intervene and help them manage it. 
And also, many of the patients we find out don't utilize their inhaler, so they really need to be instructed on proper inhaler use, proper use of the medications, timing. The patient education is a huge piece of this. And so that that's an excellent. Did you all know that COPD is now the third leading cause of death in this country? Wow. It, it wasn't expected to reach that until 2030. And if you look at the vital statistics, you know, number one is cardiovascular disease. That's decreased from 2010 to 2011. Um, number two is cancer. That's decreased from 20. 10 to 2011, but CO lower chronic respiratory disease or COPD has increased from 2010 to 2011. So this is you're going to be seeing more and more of this. Yeah. Any questions? Um, as we, as Dr. Duval mentioned, there will be new efforts to continue with this. Study. So there'll be additional uh, ways to continue with the study and expand it and continue to refine and find a simple ways to help clinicians uh, screen earlier for COPD. We have, as you know, good screening for depression. We have a screening for other conditions. COPD, as, uh, as the population ages um, and uh, continues to suffer for this, we need some, some easy to use uh, targeted screening. So uh, we hope you will consider participating in the future. And, and the way we want to do that is what Lindy uh, referred to is we agree. Nobody needs another piece of paper. Um, that, that's the old way. What we want to do is utilize maybe these tablets, talking tablets, uh, somehow get this screening while patients are sitting in the waiting room and they need to be entertained. You know, this is a good way to get capture the information and have it uploaded directly to your EHR for your review. Um, so you don't have to go searching through reams of paper. And I think that was part of the reason we missed some of the diagnosis. Well, and Dr. Duval, the other thing with this second, this next phase that we're going into is that that same program we can incorporate in patient education videos. Um, so we could talk to the group about whether they'd like to to also um, utilize that, and it can deliver the the videos about COBT, COPD to the patients while they're sitting there as well. I don't know if we want to do that in this study or not, but it would be available if we wanted to. Okay. Um, it would be good to get input from your doctors here at the clinic, you know, as to what they'd like to see in those videos because they know their patients better than anyone. Absolutely. Well, they could even, we could even shoot them and put them in as the video, so providing the education okay. to their patients. Yes, shoot the doctors. <laughs> With a <the> camera. <laughs> here we have some reality. Okay. Well, thank you, every, um, again, thank you, thank Dr. You. Duvall, thank you, Dr. Aguilar, thank you, everyone, for participating on this call. And um, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email myself or, or um, anyone else on the LANET team. If you have a question for Dr. Duvall, we can definitely relay that, um, and Dr. Aguilar. So thank you again. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. thank you, Vanessa and Dr. Aguilar and Dr. Duvall. Great work. Thank, Thank you, you, Lindsay. Thank you very much.